Shabbat Shalom. Um, let's do the blessing for studying Torah. Let me move it over so you can all see it. And here we go. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotah V'tzibanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, who hallows us with mitzvot, commanding us to engage with words of Torah. Okay, so let's just recap where we were last time. Um, anybody want to recap or remember there, there was a civil war, right? <clears throat> Who led the oh. civil war against King David? Absalom. Absalom. Right. And, you know, when someone's a traitor of that ilk, uh, you're supposed to off with his head. But, you know, David, of course, didn't want to do that. So Joab did the dirty deed, Joab being his general. And then he went and mourned for day, for Absalom, right? And, uh -huh. you know, in a way that could really affect the morale of his troops. Yeah. And Joab, you know, kind of had to Hold say, look, get over yourself, you know? Um, so uh, the, we, we got sort of towards the end of the second book of Samuel. <clears throat> we're not, we're going to finish it today. And it sort of shifted into some other strange uh, poetry that was not at all like anything that we read before about David, right? It's, it starts off with a psalm, which David supposedly composed, but unlikely. <clears throat> and it, it sort of takes on this theology that's not at all the theology that we've found so far. You know, that David is a pious king and all of that. It's like, excuse me, what? I mean, yeah, God chose him. He uh, unified the country. He protected the country against the Philistines. He created Jerusalem as the administrative and religious capital of the country. Those are all good things, um, but he wasn't exactly, you know, and what we were reading, you know, is like, okay, God needs to be pacified with either a sacrifice or something. I mean, this is just not at all like, you know, the theology we were reading before. So most likely this is from another source that was tacked on for one reason or another. It's sort of like, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you know, it's all very cynical, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, rich people, you know, die just as much as poor people, evil people get rewarded. I mean, it's just very cynical. And then all of a sudden at the end, it says, follow all the myths vote and your life will be fine. You know, something like that. And it's like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. So, you know, we have to make sure that David is pious. And then of course, if we read about him in the book of Chronicles, it'll be very different from what we've been reading. Um, as I said last time, I think, you know, if anybody wants to ban a book, the Bible is pretty racy, right? Um, and we will get to a, another slightly racy piece as well. So we left off, uh, we're up to the second book of Samuel, uh, chapter 24. And I'm going to share, here it is, move it over. There we are. Okay, can everybody see this? Yes, okay. You're all muted, so of course you cannot answer. Um, all right, so <clears throat> now all of a sudden, God's angry. We have no idea why. Another weird thing, it's like this is another chapter that's very uh, kind of strange. Uh, anyway, does somebody wanna read? I can read a little bit. Okay, Sandy, thank you. But when I stop, that's it. Okay. Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go, count the people of Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab and, and the commanders of the army who were with him, Go through the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and take a census of the people so that I may know how many there are. But Joab said to the king, may the Lord your God increase the number of the people a hundredfold while the eyes of my Lord the king can still see it. But why does my Lord the king want to do this? But the king's word prevailed against Joab and the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army went out from the presence of the king to take a census of the people of Israel. They crossed the Jordan and began from Aror 
and from the city that was in the midst of the valley towards Gad and on to Jazar. Then they came to Gilead and Kadesh in the land of the Hittites, and they came to Dan. And from Dan they went around to Sidon and came to the fortress of Tyra, Tyra, and to all the cities of the Hivites and the Canaanites. They went out to the Negev of Judah at Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came back to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days. Joy reported to the to the king the number of those who had been recorded. In Israel, there were 800,000 soldiers able to draw a sword, and those of G Judah were 500,000. Okay, somebody else. Thank you. No, thank you very much. We're going to stop here for a second. Okay, so first of all, we have no idea why God is angry, right? It comes out of nowhere. But is and he, God's yeah. supposed to be perfect, and, and they, so he shouldn't have anger. Well, yeah, God in uh, the, the, the Bible gets angry a lot and jealous and all sorts of things, right? Um, which is why Christians say that the God of the Old Testament is the God of wrath and the God of the New Testament is the God of love. I don't think it's that simple. And again, you know, who wrote this? It's two people different who, gods? I'm sorry? Are they saying two different gods? No, they're saying God, you know, once Jesus came along, I guess God got nice. I don't know. Because oh. <laughs> he had children. I guess so. Yeah, that, that would make you really nice, right? Because <laughs> um, he retired. <laughs> yeah, something like that. So, um, so we don't know why God is angry. And then uh, the vocabulary in Hebrew is apparently very different here. And um, taking a census causes terrible problems. The reason God is saying take a census is because then, then God's going to punish them for having a census. And that's the way God is going to, uh, you know, you know, he's angry and this is how he's going to punish them for doing census, which God, God himself has asked for. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, here God is intervening in a very direct way, which was not the case in any other part of the book. Right. I mean, yes, David is God's anointed, but God doesn't say, oh, you know, go do this or go do that. Um, and, uh, let's see. Yeah. The census, according to Rashi, Rashi says an evil eye holds sway over counting. And then in, um, in the book of Exodus, which we read long ago, the, those who counted had to offer a half a, sh I mean, those who are counted had to offer half a shekel as ransom for their lives. In other words, yeah. counting, I'll get to you one sec, Christine. Yeah. Counting is a, is a dangerous thing. And in order to not be struck dead, each Israelite had to offer half a shekel. Um, and, <laughs> and it's, it's unreasonable and unrealistic to think that the entire nation was going to be counted here in the middle of everything. Um, and, uh, you know, often it's for conscription to the army that people are counted, but okay, yeah. Christine, go ahead. Well, it's uh, the, the oldest profession actually is, is tax collector, but, <laughs> but not prostitute, although metaphorically, but, um, but the, uh, but census taking has always been recognized by local people as related to taxation or uh -huh. something. Yeah, it is evil. I mean, there's an evil eye over the taxation. And so one of the oldest acts of defiance is evading the census. <laughs> uh, well, we know that the census that was taken in this country last year was mm. not done so well, right? Right. Apparently, there, there are states that have overcounted, there are states that have undercounted, and this is how you end up getting representation in Washington. So that's pretty yeah. problematic. Yeah. Um, and they had they had uh, Trump reduce the number of census takers, so some areas of the country weren't counted at all, and native native communities were ignored. I mean, it it was monstrously corrupt, so, and it hadn't been before. Yeah. Well, my youngest son took census, and a lot of people just shut the door in his face. Really? Yeah. So. I, yeah, I, worked, I worked in, in the census too, and a lot yeah. of people just, nope, they yeah. thought there was some sort of conspiracy. Yeah. They didn't want to be counted. 
Well, of course, yeah. if they so. believe the Bible, they would have been struck dead had they been counted. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, there were problems even, you know, people you did contact. I guess you should always have a half a shekel on hand. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Have a half a shekel. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So this, this counting the census is gonna not end well. All right, let's go on. <clears throat> so we'll go down to here. Okay, somebody like to pick it up here? I can pick it up. Okay, Jane. But afterward, David was stricken to the heart because he had numbered the people. David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O oh Lord, I pray you, take away the guilt of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. When David rose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet God, Gad, sorry, <laughs> David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, three things I offer you. Choose one of them, and I will do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him. He asked him, Shall seven years of famine come to you on your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall re return to the one who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into human hands. Okay, so basically, David wants to repent from mm. having taken the census that God asked him to do. And he has three options, <clears throat> right? It can be seven years of famine, or you can be pursued for three months by your enemies, or there'll be pestilence for three days in the land. Now, I don't know. I would think that if you were the leader of a country, maybe you wouldn't choose pestilence for the entire country and you might sacrifice yourself. In fact, when you think about the difference between what happened in Afghanistan and what happened in Ukraine, in Afghanistan, when the Taliban took over, the president fled immediately. Yeah. In uh, Ukraine, Zelensky yes. has stayed to the risk of his own life, you know. So here it doesn't, to me, this is not a very uh, noble way of paying your debts. Um, I want to read a note from uh, Robert Alter on verse 14. There's a puzzle in David's choice because only one of the three punishments, the flight from enemies, clearly involves human agency. In other words, the other two things, famine and uh, pestilence, are all something that God would do. Although these days famine is very connected to human agency, right? Wars and drought and whatever. But perhaps David has in mind that an extended famine would lead to absolute dependence on those foreign nations unaffected by the famine, as in the story of Joseph, Joseph's brothers going down to Egypt. So if there was a famine, this is, I mean, it's so connected to what's going on today because all these countries have been dependent on Russian oil, right? right? And because of that, you know, there are countries that don't want to get on the bad side of Putin. And so what Alter is speculating is that that choice would mean that Israel would be dependent on other countries for food, just the way, you know, the, uh, the Canaanites or the people living in Canaan, the, the Israelites who are living in Canaan had to come down to Egypt and say, you know, we need food because there's a famine or all the times that Abraham had to leave or his son, you know, because of a famine. And then you're dependent on another country. And so God forbid, right? In all this, it should be noted that David is scarcely the same character we have seen in the body of his story. Instead of that figure of conflicting feelings and emotions, so remarkable in psychological depth, we have a flat character instigated to act by God, then expressing remorse, then speaking in rather official tones in his role as political ruler, and cultic chief responsible for all the people. You know, this is not the David we saw before. Yeah, Christine, go ahead. Well, he he's all, you know, he's used to fleeing in front of his enemies, right? Yeah. I mean, that would be an easy call. He's yeah. evaded them for his whole freaking life. So, well, you know, you know, yeah. Well, he was an amazing warrior, but at this point he's older. So maybe he's just not so 
mm. you know, confident that he could beat them or he's just tired and he doesn't want to have to do this anymore. Um, so he's not going to choose that. He's going to choose pestilence. Mm. Okay, uh, Jane, you want to continue? Yeah. So the Lord sent the pestilence on Israel from that morning until the appointed time. And 70,000 of the people died from Dan to Beersheba. But when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented concerning the evil and said to the angel who was bringing destruction among the people, it is enough. Now stay your hand. The angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. David looked up and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven, and in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. And David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell on their faces. When David saw the angel who was destroying the people, he said to the Lord, I alone have sinned, and I, the shepherd, have done evil. But these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and against my father's house. Again, this is not the David we've come to know and love, right? Um, <laughs> On the other hand, he's not doing it until after, you know, several times. Right? Yeah. 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 All of a sudden it's like, oh, maybe I've gone too far with this. What is, you know, it's interesting. What is, what is the definition of pestilence in this context? It's like, you know, a plague or something. You know? Actually, just some kind of virus. It's you know, my like, guess, you know. Like, you know, like COVID-19. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's interesting, this uh, scene here of um, David looked up and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven and his hand, a drawn sword stretch out over Jerusalem. That's sort of the image of when Adam and Eve are kicked out of Eden. And the, the cher cherubs, who, again, are not the puffy cheek cuties, they're nasty creatures, um, are, are there also guarding Eden, you know, with swords. So um, I, I don't know if that you're supposed to think of Jerusalem as sort of like Eden or something, but anyway, so yeah. Uh, it's where really, the king is. I'm He's, sorry, what? It's where the king is. He's yeah, still uh -huh. and by the way, you know, supposedly the reason that David picked this particular punishment is because remember he says in verse 14, let us fall into the hand of the Lord for his mercy is great. In other words, you know, I'm choosing pestilence, but yeah, God is not going to be too horrible because God is angry, but God also has mercy, unlike human beings who might just, you know, want to destroy. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, if this is merciful to have 70,000 people die, I, I, I don't know, you know, but theoretically, that's why he chose this particular, uh, you know, punishment. Harvey, go ahead. I'm wondering. I, I, I'm totally confused because why? Why is David and and the, uh, the people of Israel being uh, punished? Because God wanted David to do, you know, incited him to do the uh, the counting in the first right. place. Right. Well, it, I don't it, understand. It, okay. Apparently, he incited him to do something that would punish the people. So another, I mean, it's weird because God could just say, I'm punishing you because I'm angry. But instead, God said, do this thing that's going to make me even angrier and I'm going to punish you. You know, I don't know what the logic is behind that. The book of Job all over again. Mickey. Maybe it's also to give God an excuse for why God's doing this, because we don't even know why God is angry. Go ahead. What I read in here in this commentary on it was that, um, uh, let me find it here a second, um, inciting, because in this it says God incited right. David, it says uh, that uh, God, uh, that inciting does not mean commanding, but only putting the idea in David's mind. Or it remained David's decision whether actually to carry the census out. Oh, good. Oh, that really sounds like Trump. <laughs> <laughs> God gave me the idea, but I did it. I, okay, so that's good. So um, let me just read you what Alter wrote about this, this anger business. 
The reason for God's wrath is entirely unspecified and attempts to link it to events in the preceding narrative are quite unconvincing. At least that's his, I'm sure somebody who's much more pious would say, the Israelites did something wrong, right? In fact, this entire narrative unit is strikingly different in theological assumptions in its imagination of narrative situation and character, and even in its style from the David story proper, as well as from the tale of David and the Gibeonites. Da, da, da. Perhaps there is no discernible reason for God's fury against Israel. The God of the story has a look of acting arbitrarily, exacting terrible human costs in order to be placated, right? The reason for the pestilence is so, so God can stop being angry. Like, okay, I've done this thing. I've killed 70,000. I feel better now. <laughs> Um, unlike the deity of the previous chapters, he's decidedly an interventionist God pulling the human actors by strings. And he may well be a capricious God here, quote, inciting David to carry out a census that will only bring grief to the people. So you're right. I mean, David does do it, but David wouldn't have thought of that, that idea unless God had said, do this, right? But um, uh now, why uh, verse three, but why should my Lord, the king, desire this thing? And what Alter says is underlying the story is both a cultic and a superstitious fear of the census reflected in Joab's objection to it. Joab is saying, like, don't do it, right? Several commentators have noted that according to Exodus, blah, 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 every Israelite counted in a, in a census was required to pay half a shekel, a ransom. Since such payment could not be realistically expected in a total census of the nation, masses of people would be put in a condition of violation of ritual. But there's also a folkloric horror of being counted as a condition of vulnerability to mal malignant forces, right? Christy would know more about this than I would. But somehow it's like saying to the evil eye, yeah, Christine, Sherry, you know, Jane, Sandy, right? And then the evil eye can go, oh, I hadn't noticed those, those people. Now I can get to them. As I said, and Rashi's word for the evil eye holds way over counting. Beyond these considerations, Joab the commander may have a political concern in mind. The census served as a basis for conscription and thus imposing the census might conceivably have provoked opposition to the threatened conscription and to the king who was behind it. And it is carried out by army officers. So um, apparently Joab once again has some you know, political savvy um, and then we've got this like sort of puppet king that does what God says. So it's a very strange and confusing chapter, even to Robert Alter, who's yeah. much more knowledgeable than I am. Um, and, and, you know, this is a God here, which is not a very sophisticated God who can be a God who can be placated by some kind of a ritual or some kind of a punishment. You know, God's angry. And this is sort of more like the, you know, the pagan gods, right? They get angry. You have to placate them. You know, our God supposedly is asking you to behave in a moral and ethical way. And if you do that, all will be well. You don't have a God in, you know, most of the rest of this where God says, here, do something, and then I'm going to punish you for it. It's very strange. Okay. Okay. Any other uh, comments or questions? No, here we go. All right. Uh, here, now this, this is gonna be another way to placate God. Okay, go, you wanna finish this off, Jane? Sure. That day, Gad came to David and said to him, go up and erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Araunna, the Jebusite. Following Gad's instructions, David went up as the Lord had commanded. When Arauna looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming towards him. And Arauna went out and prostrated himself before the king with a face to the ground. Honey, leave me alone now. <laughs> Arauna <laughs> said, why has my lord the king come to his servant? David said to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord so that the plague may be averted from the people. Then Ar Aruna said to David, let my Lord, the king, take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering and the th 
threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Aruna gives to the king. And Aruna said to the king, may the Lord your God respond favorably to you. But the king said to Aruna, no, but I will buy them from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and offerings of well-being. So the Lord answered his supplication for the, la for the land, and the plague was averted from Israel. <clears throat> so you see here, a sacrifice has to be made to placate God after God has, you know, wreaked God's, you know, anger on the whole, a whole population. Um, <clears throat> so that's very unlike the God that we've known so far. Um, and then do you see a parallel here? Uh, David's trying to buy this land. Like the guy says to him, no, nah, I'll just give it to you. And David says, no, 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 I'm going to buy it from you. Does that sound like anything that you've seen before? Sure. He's done it before. <laughs> Abraham. <laughs> Abraham. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. No, um, David just took stuff. and, and Yeah, like, exactly. David even took yeah. stuff in the past. Right. Here he's negotiating, just like Abraham negotiated for the cave of Machpelah. And, you know, this is, I guess, a very Middle Eastern sort of way of behaving, right? Like, I'm going to give it to you. No, no, I'm going to pay for it. No, no, no. You know, back and forth, the bargaining. Some of you are familiar with that, having lived in those uh, places. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, he wants to legitimately take this land, unlike, right, what he, remember that story about the little the lamb that uh, the guy had only one lamb and he took it and all that. Okay. <clears throat> so in the past, he's just taken what he's wanted, whether it's a woman or you know, something else. Um, and the other odd thing here is that David is going to his subject, Arona, because, uh, you know, here it says, why has the Lord, the king, come to the servant? And it's not really customary for a king to go to the servant. It's more customary for the servant to come to the king that he might have summoned him, right? Instead of which, here he is, you know, looking for this place himself. Um, so let me see, there's something else that's interesting. Um, let's see. It says the plague was averted from Israel, but then earlier it said, what, 20,000 people died in the- 70, yeah. No, it, it was averted. In other words, not, no more people died. Okay. <laughs> Christine. You know, you're, you're muted. I pressed it, but it didn't register. Yeah. Okay, Aruna is probably afraid he's going to get killed if the <laughs> king is visiting his place. He's probably, I mean, the kings don't visit unless there's like something in mind and it's usually not good. So, you know, he's basically saying, take all my goods, you know, go away. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, when the king wants something, he's, you know, here, take it, take it, you know. Um, <clears throat> so Alter says, Although neither of these stories is especially continuous with the David story proper, both reflect a connection with it and the emphasis on guilt that the king incurs, which brings disaster on the nation and which requires expiation. In other words, <clears throat> excuse me, even though we haven't seen a God like this who is you know, demanding sacrifices and gets angry for no reason and whatever, um, the fact is David has sinned, right? We know that David sinned. He, committed adultery and murder. And so even though this story is weird and it's kind of like from a very different point of view, it does emphasize David's guilt and the fact that because of his guilt, uh, the, the people are gonna suffer and something has to be done. But he says, but the writer of genius responsible for the larger David narrative imagines guilt in far more probing moral terms and does not assume that the consequences of moral offenses and grave political misjudgments can be reversed by some ritual act. In other words, so I'm gonna just stop for one sec. So in other words, you know, David has been guilty of sins and we learned about it in a very, you know, complex way. Uh, you know, the story of, first of all, his, you know, 
taking Bathsheba, how he maneuvers to get her husband killed, and then what happens with his kids. And I mean, it's a very well developed character and you know scenarios. Here, it's very sort of uh, two dimensional. You know, uh, there's this guilt incurred by what God told David to do, and he gets punished, and the whole people get punished, and then the God is placated. How can he? How can God justify? punishing somebody for something you told them to do. Well, I guess they didn't have to do it. You know, in other words, yeah, I, I, God might have given this, as, as Mickey said before, the inciting is to give the, give him the idea, but he, you know, he went through with it, right? So <clears throat> even though God, I mean, God didn't order him to do it. God put the idea in his head and he went ahead and did it. Yeah, but God becomes a kind of weasel. Like, yeah, really I, yeah, I agree. No, yeah. it's in the uh, the he isn't the Hebrew in the imperative take a census. I would isn't have that an have, order. I don't have the Hebrew right in front of me here. Well, well, just looking at the English, just looking at the English, it sounded you know, like I, an I, order. Let me let me get the Hebrew. Let me get the Hebrew and look. Because you know the translations are always. Mm -hmm. somewhat problematic okay let's see two samuel what chapter is that 25 24 uh, no, it's 24 okay no it's chapter 24 and it says go count israel and judah okay wait so it's, uh, first line and i'm almost there i've got the hebrew here wait a second um but it sounds like the imperative well let's see what it says okay Af Adonai laharot be Israel. Uh, you know the way they talk. The way they, the word for anger is your nose flares out, because everything's very very concrete in in uh, Hebrew, right? So God's nose was flaring out. Vayaset et David. Okay, Yaset, lemor lech. Yeah, he says go, go and count the people. That's true. Now, let's see what the traditional commentators have to say about that. Because they can't think that uh, God is bad. Don't bad things happen to people when they don't do what God tells them to do? Yes. So I All right, let's see what, this is the, uh, the more orthodox way of understanding it. The chapter begins by saying that God was angry, very angry with Israel. It is axiomatic that divine anger is provoked only by sin. But scripture does not specify the sin that precipitated God's wrath. Okay, that much they are admitting. We don't know why. It's also axiomatic that great people are judged by very exacting standards. Misdeeds that would be trivial when committed by others are considered to be serious when committed by people such as David and the nation that lived in a time of prophecy and the visible presence of holiness. So this is a period of time when you know, God was much more visible to us than God is today. The sages of the Midrash elaborated upon by Ramban assert that the people sinned by not asking that a temple be built. Okay, here now they're going to come up with some reasons for why God was angry. They didn't ask for a temple to be built. Oh, gee, that's, that's clever. For many years, the Holy Ark had been in makeshift temporary shelters, like a stranger wandering the land. Although the Torah says many times that there would be a temple as the central dwelling of the Shekhinah, the same nation that had vociferously demanded a king decades before took no notice of its lack of a temple. By the way, the book of Deuteronomy says, you will bring sacrifices to the place that I designate, but it's never specified that that, that place is Jerusalem. Um, and, you know, look, this, this is all written and edited afterwards. These people probably in those days were still worshiping on little mountaintops and trees and whatever right i mean there and that's why you've got this description of a deity that's kind of capricious because you know it's it's the remnants of what was there before only david had requested it but god refused him that was remember david asked to build a temple and god said no you've got too many too much blood on your hands now the people truly wanted it a temple might well have been built in the time of the judges or even by david see it's the people's fault it is noteworthy that the entire episode of this chapter ends when David purchased the future site of the temple. Ah, that's what he purchased. He thought it was just a little place to make a sacrifice. No. What he did was he 
purchase the land that was going to be the place of the future temple. There's nothing that indicates that. This is just, you know, kind of very uh, pious interpretation. So he was commanded to build an altar there, which implies that after the suffering that atoned for the nation's apathy toward the temple, the groundwork was laid for its future construction. A barber now suggests that the reason for God's wrath was the seditious, widely supported insurrection of Sheba, son of Bichri. Remember him from last time? Which had hitherto gone unpunished. <coughs> this, still, this loyalty was all the more sinful since the people had been had been, had been severely punished for its support of Absalom's rebellion. And Ab Barbara now knows that the angel who administered the plague was told to stay his hand when he arrived at Jerusalem, which is at the border of the territory of Judah, the one tribe that had no part in Sheba's rebellion. Okay, so they find a way to completely justify this punishment. Um, Whatever the underlying cause of God's anger with the nation, the immediate cause was a surprising error by David. Although the Torah specifically bans the census of the nation, except in an indirect manner and for an important cause, David ordered such a census, even though Joab pleaded with him not to do so. By the way, you know, if you go to an Orthodox uh, minion, for example, to pray, they won't, you know, you want to make sure there are 10 people, 10 adults there, 10 men. Ten, um, ten men. The way they count is not one, not two, not three, okay? Because they, you're not supposed to count people. And then it says that David succumbs to a faulty desire and orders the census. So let's see what they say about he incited David. It is inconceivable that God would actually force David to sin. And it is especially absurd to suppose that God would punish someone for following through on such an imposed thought, right? As we were all saying. So they're going to find a way to make this not God's command. The meaning is rather that David's thoughts and actions are ascribed to being God's doing in the same general sense that we say that God is the cause of all events in the universe. So David had the idea to do the census and said it was God, but it was not really God because God could never have ordered him to sin. This is slightly convoluted logic. Go ahead, Christine. This is sounding more and more like Isaac Singer's The Elders of Hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this chapter is pretty crazy, right? And then it says the parallel verse in Chronicles reads a Satan, i.e. an evil impulse, incited David to count Israel. He could have resisted the impulse, and he realized later that he should have done so. God merely put the idea into his mind, as you said, Mickey, so that if he failed to withstand the test, the census would be the catalyst to punish the people for their own sin, whatever it was. So in other words, even if God had put the idea and it wasn't David saying, oh, this must be God, it was a test. And David should have resisted the test. And having not resisted it, there's punishment. I, that's very convoluted, wouldn't you think? But it's clever. And therefore, there wouldn't be the land purchased to build the temple. All's well that ends well, right? Um, then we've got, okay, the reason that God incited David was in retribution for a misstatement of his. In his last confrontation with Saul, when he said once again that he bore Saul no malice, David said, if it is God who has incited you against me. At that time, God said, as it were, you have accused me of being an inciter. By your life, I will incite you to do something that even school children know is forbidden. So this is payback for David saying that God incited him against Saul or Saul's family, or that, uh, yeah or no, I'm sorry, the other way around, that uh, God might have incited them against him. Um, so having said this misstatement, God had to then pay him back by inciting him to do something that he should have known better not to have done. <laughs> Even though David's intention was to spare Saul from embarrassment by saying that his hatred of David was not his fault, his improper expression caused him to lose the divine protection against sin that he had earned. The result was that he fell prey to the incitement. 
So, and then what's David's motive for the census? Okay, there are of course different possibilities depending on whom you ask. He simply wished to celebrate the large numbers of people in his kingdom. This is implied by our verse, which quotes David as saying, so that I may know the number of the people. It is sinful to conduct such a census, even if the people are not counted by the head, but they asked to, be, to submit coins or some other objects, and then the submissions are counted. In other words, instead of counting each person, they, they give money and you count that. Okay, second possibility. He seemed to put his trust in military might rather than in God's help, because this is like a, a conscription. Accordingly, he wanted a census to determine how many potential soldiers were at his disposal. Third possibility, the census was in response to the new political situation. Earlier in his kinship, he could rely on huge numbers of volunteers whenever the nation had to go to war. Now, after two popular rebellions indicating that his support had waned, he thought that he might have to resort to a military draft in the event of war. So he wanted to know how many able-bodied men there were. Yes, Christine. You, you can't build a temple without it costing money. And uh, half a shekel a piece out of like, what is it, a million five hundred people, that's quite a bit of money. And um, so I, you know, what, what am I saying? You know, conscription on the one hand, but not necessarily for the military, but maybe for building the temple and then the money that's necessary to build the temple, eh, you know. But who am I? I'm just I'm just a woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't count at all. Um, okay, I I think I believe that is the end of the book of Samuel. Now the end of ah, I've got too many things here. Okay, the the end of David's story is in the beginning of the book of Kings. Now, why is it in a separate book? So even though it's completing David's story, it is also describing the ascension of Solomon. So that's why it's split there. And it's written after the destruction of Judah. And it's again from disparate sources. Um, but apparently the Assyrian and Babylonian, Babylonian annals record these events. So these are somewhat historical events that we're gonna be reading about because you, you have corroboration in other sources. And so it's part history and part folk tales. So let me find the next section because let's see, will it go right to the next book? Yes, it will, good, all right. All right, we'll go down here. Now, of course, has anybody, did anybody watch the series called Succession? It's very good. It's called. It's about the Murdoch family, and uh, it starts. Oh off, yeah, that one. Oh, starts off with a you know the head of the, the this empire uh, who's Rupert Murdoch. In the in the series, he has a stroke or something, and he you know looks like he's not going to come back to life in any significant way. So of course, all the kids are struggling to figure out who's going to succeed him. And even though he does come back, there's and it's very close to reality, by the way. Um, the fighting for who's going to be the heir to the uh, throne. So, of course, anytime you have siblings and you've got a big position of power coming up, there's going to be fighting and juggling, right? So, go ahead, Christine. Kevin Klein did a great sort of uh, parody of uh, Rupert Murdoch in one of those wonderful um, Brit coms. Uh, about a zoo that uh, John Cleese is also in. I forget the name of the movie, oh. but it's hilarious. And Kevin Klein is brilliant as Rupert Mur Murdoch. Oh wow! And and his and his son, right? I mean, so it's, so, Rupert it's Murdoch merciless. Has, right? He has two sons and a daughter. I mean, there are other kids. Well, in, in, in the movie, them. there's just the son. But, but <laughs> no. But so now we're going to have some jockeying for position, as David's days are coming to an end. All right, so let me share this. Oops, we got an ad here. We don't want any ads. Okay, um, so if I move this over, it won't move over. Okay, whatever. Ah, hello, come back. What happened? There we go. One Kings, okay. 
Uh, so would somebody like to read The Struggle for Succession? Yeah, uh, go ahead, Christine. Right up my alley here. Okay. <laughs> King David was old and advanced in years, and although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. So, oh boy, does that ring, ring true? Okay. So, so, yeah, he's yeah, yeah he's old, right? Yeah, right. Why does it say old and advanced? Because it's the same thing. The yeah, same right. Thing. Good point. Let's see. Yeah. He's old and old. I mean, Let me see. Yeah. he's old and old. He's really old. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Uh, it, it, yeah, I don't have uh, any commentary on that, okay. unfortunately, right. yeah. Okay. okay, so his servants said to him, let a young virgin be sought for my lord the king, oh great, and let her wait on the king and be his attendant. Let her lie in your bosom so that my lord the king may be warm. Well, this sounds like Gandhi in his aging years. So they searched for a beautiful young woman throughout the ter all the territory of Israel and found Abishag the Shunammite and brought her to the king. The young woman was very beautiful. She became the king's attendant and served him, but the king did not know her sexually. Okay, so let's just stop here for a moment. Tell me how this contrasts with what we knew about King David when he was younger. Very virile. virile. He was virile. He, he was yeah. sexy, right? He exposed himself to young women. Remember that? That's when Michal got really angry. Yeah. He um, also just took any woman he wanted. Took any woman he wanted. He, he had wives and remember he had those 10 concubines and here he's got this beautiful young virgin and she's just serving as a blanket. But he's old. <laughs> exactly. That's and damn. advanced in years. Yes. <laughs> And it, it's to emphasize, you know, his yes. impotence, really, at this point, you know, they impotence have, sexually. They didn't have Viagra. Oh, they didn't have uh, Viagra. Viagra, yeah. yeah. Um, Thank goodness there would have been like, oh, uh, you know, somebody would be 127,000 years old. Oh, you, you know what? <laughs> Actually, I, I remember now that when I, I was on an airplane once sitting next to somebody who had fought in Afghanistan, and he said that the uh, tribal leaders, you know, the warlords, the one thing they wanted was that blue pill. <laughs> I think it's blue, right, Viagra? Yeah. 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 Um, so here you have, you know, this king who is virile and sexual and sexy and strong and, uh, and he's just lying there with this virgin who's beautiful and she just is a bed warmer, <laughs> which is pretty funny. Um, <laughs> Then uh, Alter draws a parallel here. So his servants said, let a young virgin be sought uh, or let them seek out a virgin, depending on how you translate it, is parallel to when King Saul was sort of depressed and they said, let us seek out a man who's skilled in playing the liar. Sort of a parallel to that. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so now you've got this poor king who's like, you know, obviously impotent in many ways. And, um, Okay, why won't my cursor go where it's supposed to go? It's not going there. Oh, dear. Uh, okay, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to move this uh, thing here. All right, let's just read what we have and then have figure it. out yeah. what's going on. My cursor is going behind the screen instead of on top of it. Oh, <laughs> That's like, right. God. All it's right, go ahead and read warmer. the next paragraph. <laughs> It's a beautiful young virgin trying to keep your computer warm. <laughs> really? Something like that. Uh, now, Adina, uh, Adonijah, the son of Hagith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. He prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. His father had never at any time reprimanded him by asking, why have you done thus and so? He was also a very handsome man, and he was born next after Absalom. He conferred with Joab, son of Jeruiah, and with the priest Abiatar, and they supported Adonijah. But, but the, oh, that's the dog's going nuts. But the priest Zadok and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and the prophet Natan and Shammah and his companions, David's own warriors, did not sign, side with Adonijah, 
Great. I'm going to have to stop and deal with the dogs. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. My, my cursor came back. Okay. So um, Adonijah is the next in line to the throne. So theoretically, he should be the next king. Of course, he just announces, I will be king. His father is still alive, let us note. Um, and he's preparing chariots for himself, kind of like Absalom, right? He's going to take the power into his own hands. I have to leave, OK? Oh, dear. OK. Goodbye. Bye. I have a question. Yeah. It says, Adonijah, son of Haggith. Yeah, and I thought this is the son of David. Yeah, Hagit is the, is the wife. Oh, the wife, okay. Remember, he has lots of wives, okay? So um, <clears throat> he's preparing chariots and horsemen and doing all this stuff, just like Absalom, right? Taking the power into his own hands. And of course, it says his father had never reprimanded him, right? I mean, remember, David is a very weak father. He's just not able to control his kids or to, you know, do whatever a father's supposed to do. So now you see Joab, the general is taking the side of Anonijah, but the prophet Nathan is not. So let's see what happens with that. Okay, if you can, Christine. And you're, you're muted, you're muted, you're muted. She said she had to take care of the dog. No, no, she's back. She's back. I, yeah, oh. I'm back. I'm back. The dogs are muted. <laughs> Ad I don't want to ask what that means. <laughs> what are microwaves for? <laughs> Ad Adonisha sacrificed sheep, oxen, and fatted cattle by the stone Zohoyalet, which was, is be beside Al Rogel. And he invited all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the royal officials of Judah. But he did not invite the prophet Nathan or Benaiah or the warriors or his brother Solomon. Then Nathan said to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king and our Lord David does not know it? Now therefore come, let me give you advice so that you may save your own life and the life of your son, Solomon. Go in at once to King David and say to him, did you not, my Lord, the king, swear to your servant saying, your son Solomon shall, su shall succeed me as king and he shall sit on my throne? Why then is Adonijah king? Then while you are still there speaking with the king, I will come in after you and confirm your words. Okay, let's just stop for one second. So first of all, Adonisha is having this sort of sacrificial event, which is sort of a coronation uh, feast. Yeah. Right? Um, didn't invite Nathan, obviously, or any of the people who um, <clears throat> might be against him or his brother. So now <clears throat> you have a king who neither knows this beautiful virgin sexually, nor does he know what's going on in his own court at this point, right? So he needs Nathan to go to Bathsheba, who's Solomon's mother, and say, hey, this is going on. This is not good for you, right? Remember, in those days, you had to depend on your son or your husband or your father, if you were a woman, to take care of you. And obviously, you'd be much better taken care of if your son happened to be king rather than, you know, either a subject or killed by the other guy. Um, so now... You know, they're sort of scheming behind David's back. Let's go in there and, uh, you know, try to convince him that this is not a good thing. And now it says, go in at once to King David and say to him, did you not, my lord, the king, swear to your servant, saying your son Solomon shall succeed me as king? I don't remember seeing that anywhere. And it may or may not have happened. Uh, certainly Nathan is using that as a way to get David to, you know, endorse Solomon. So well, he's also asking Bathsheba, who is not only the mother of Solomon, but also the king's favorite wife. Yeah. So okay. now remember Bathsheba, remember her. She was on the roof mm -hmm. and he brings her over, sleeps with her, gets her pregnant gets her husband killed. We don't ever hear her say a word. We have not heard from her at all since that time. Uh -huh. And now we're gonna discover that she's quite eloquent. Okay. 
So Basheva went to the king in his room. The king was very old. Abhishag the Shunamite was attending the king. Basheva bowed and did obeisance to the king, and the king said, what do you wish? She said to him, my lord, you swore to your servant by the Lord your God, saying, your son Solomon shall succeed me as king, and he shall sit on my throne. But now suddenly Adonijah has become king, though you, my lord the king, do not know it. He has sacrificed oxen, fatted cattle, and sheep in abundance, and has invited all the children of the king, the priests Abiathar, and Joab, the commander of the army, but your servant Solomon he has not invited. But you, my lord the king, the eyes of all Israel are on you to tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Otherwise, it will come to pass when my lord the king sleeps with his ancestors, that my son Solomon and I will be counted offenders. Okay, thank you. So first of all, interestingly, uh, this, this seems a little bit parallel to the story uh, of Purim where uh, Mordecai mm -hmm. says to Esther, go into the king yeah. and tell him, right? Being pushed by a man. Um, okay. And, you know, it, we know that in the case of uh, King Ahasuerus, if you go in unbidden, you could be killed. I don't think that's the case here. However, you know, going in unbidden is not necessarily what these wives do, right? We haven't seen any of the wives. Well, we saw Abigail before she married him, mm -hmm. give him very good advice about not getting blood on his hands. But, you know, otherwise, you know, just coming into, and he wasn't the king at that point. Um, when someone's a king, you don't just barge in and say, I've got something to talk to you about. But, you know, obviously in this case, he's weak. And, uh, you know, she is the favorite wife, most probably. So she goes in there and again, like remember in the book of Ruth, when uh, Naomi says to Ruth, go into Boaz, right? We've got that situation too. Go into Bo Boaz and tell him X, Y, or Z, or let him tell you, right? Mm -hmm. And actually she takes matters into her own hands and she's the one who tells Boaz what to do. Here, mm -hmm. You know, Nathan said, here, tell him this one thing. And she's like going into much more detail, you know, improvising um, and, you know, making a lot of sense. Like, hey, you know, if you don't put Solomon on the throne, he and I are probably going to be, you know, offed. Uh, and, you know, you need to announce this, right? So everyone knows that this is what you wish. And, you know, she goes into a lot of detail, which, you know, would perhaps get him annoyed that this kid went off and did this thing on his own. Okay, so let's- Okay. While she was still speaking with the king, the prophet Nathan came in. What the king was told, here is the prophet Nathan or Nathan. When he came in before the king, he did obeisance to the king and his face to the ground. Nathan said, my lord, the king, have you said Adonijah shall succeed me as king and he shall sit on my throne? For today he has gone down and has sacrificed ox, oxen, fatted cattle and sheep in abundance and has invited all the king's children, Joab, the commander of the army, and the priest Abiathar, who is now eating and drinking before him and saying, long live King Adonijah. But he did not invite me, your servant, and the priest Zadok and Beniah, Beniah son of Jehoiada, and your servant Solomon. How has this thing been brought about by my lord, the king? And have you not let your servants let know who should sit on the throne of my lord, the king after him? So interestingly, he kind of parallels what Bathsheba has just said right. to really support yeah. what she's saying. And yeah. she's, you know, she's pretty clever. I mean, you know, she talks about all these things this kid is doing that, you know, are really, you know, not what he should be doing. It's not his prerogative to do it. And also, you know, if you love me, huh, you're not gonna let me get killed or you're probably your favorite son. Mm -hmm. um, and then Nathan comes along, maybe he was listening at the doorway and basically says the same thing. So, you know, I, that would be pretty convincing to have both the prophet and your favorite wife tell you exactly what's going on. Okay. Any questions or comments before we, no? Okay. King David answered, summon Bathsheba to me. So she came into the king's presence and stood before the king.
The king swore saying, as the Lord lives who has saved my life from every adversity, as I swore to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, your son Solomon shall succeed me as king and he shall sit on my throne in my place. So I will do this day. Then Bathsheba bowed her face to the ground and did obeisance to the king and said, may my Lord King David live forever. So, you know, interestingly, we don't know if he made this vow to Bathsheba, right? It was never, it, it was never indicated anywhere that, that this was what was going on. However, given the fact that he's really old and we all know what happens to our memory as we get older, it's certainly possible that now that both two people have said to him, you swore this to me, maybe he's now either remembering that he did it or thinking I must have done it because two people have just said it to me, right? Because otherwise, like, we don't know that this ever happened. So, you know, having two people come and say, you said this, and now this king is barely, you know, able to think straight. Okay, it must be true. Okay. King, David, king David said, summon me to the priest Zadok at the prophet Nathan and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada. When they came before the king, the king said to them, take with you the servants of your Lord and have my son Solomon ride on my own mule and bring him down to Gihon. There the priest Zadok and the prophet Nathan anoint him the king over Israel, then blow the trumpet and say, long live King Solomon. You shall go up following him. Let him enter and sit on my throne. He shall be king in my place, for I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, answered the king, Amen. May the Lord, the God of my Lord, the king, so ordain. As the Lord has been my Lord of the king, so may he with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord, King David. So he's actually having Solomon become king while he's still alive. Yeah. So the priest Zadok, this prophet Nathan, Beniah, the son of Jehoiada, and the Cherethites and the Pelethites went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule and led him to Gihon. There the priest Zadok took the horn of oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. Then they blew the trumpet and all the people said, long live King Solomon. And all the people went up following him, playing on pipes and rejoicing with great joy. Duh. And so that the <laughs> earth quaked at their noise. Okay, so they're having a fun party. Yeah. And um, let's see what Adonisha is going to think about that. Adonisha and all the guests who were with him heard it as they finished feasting. When Joab heard the sound of the trumpet, he said, why is the city in an uproar? While he was still speaking, Jonathan, the son of the priest Abiatar arrived. Adonisha said, come in for you are a worthy man and surely you bring good news. Jonathan answered Adonisha, no, for your Lord David has made Solomon king. The king has sent with him the priest Zadok, the prophet Nathan, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, and the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and they have had him ride on the king's mule. The priest Zadok and the prophet Nathan have anointed him king at Gihon, and they have gone up from there rejoicing so that the city is in an uproar. This is the noise you heard. Solomon now sits on the royal throne. Moreover, the king's servants came to congratulate our Lord King David, saying, may God make the name of Solomon more famous than yours and make his throne greater than your throne. The king bowed in worship on the bed and went on to pray thus, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who today has granted one of my offspring to sit on the throne and permit me to witness it. Okay, so Adonisha hears this thing going on. He's not sure. Are they maybe celebrating the fact that I'm going to be king? Who knows? But Joab hears the sound of the trumpet, which is actually the show, uh, you know, the, the ram's horn. The shofar. Yeah. yeah. Thinking, you know, maybe there's a war or something going on because he's a general. So, you know, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. If you're a general, everything's a war. Um, and then you've got the servant. You know, we have so many scenes of these servants coming and announcing the good news. Uh, guess what? You're not the king. Uh, Solomon is going to be the king and, um, you know, he's going to be even greater than King David. So, and you know, you see how these 
kings are coming in sitting on a mule, which is why you understand that Jesus comes in on a mule too, right? Because Jesus is supposed to be the uh, successor. He's supposed to be coming from the line of King David as the Messiah. Okay, okay. let's go All right. down here. I keep, Let me move. I keep wondering whether the, these mules are actually onagers, which were the the royal seeds oh, of the Egyptians. Anyway, maybe. okay, that, because otherwise they would have said a donkey. But but there we are. Then all the guests of Adonisha got up trembling and went their own ways. <laughs> yeah, they're nervous now because yeah. hey, guess <laughs> what? You just tried to take over and you're in deep trouble now. I was home. <laughs> Adonisha, <laughs> fearing Solomon, got up and went on to grasp the horns of the altar. Okay, so wait a second. Solomon, let me just yeah. let me just ask you what 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 is he doing grasping the hands of the altar? What does that mean? The sanctuary. The yes. Sanctuary. Because we know that if you go into the sanctuary and hold on to the horns of the altar, that's supposed to keep you safe, right? Yeah. Solomon was informed, Adonisha is afraid of King Solomon. See, he has laid hold of the horns of the altar, saying, let King Solomon swear to me first that he will not kill his servant with the sword. So Solomon responded, if he proves to be a worthy man, not one of his hairs shall fall on to the ground. But if wickedness is found in him, he shall die. Then King Solomon sent to have him brought down from the altar. He came to do obeisance to King Solomon, and Col Solomon said to him, go home. <laughs> so um, if evil be found in him, he shall die. The evil Solomon has in mind would be further political machinations. He thus does not agree to swear unconditionally, as Adonijah had pleaded, not to harm his half-brother, and he will make due use of the loophole he leaves himself. So he's saying, you know, if you behave yourself, you'll be okay. And that's a big loophole. And when he says, go home or go to your house, it concludes the episode on a note of ambiguity. Solomon is distancing Adonijah from the palace. He sends him to the presumed safety of his own home, or is it to a condition of virtual house arrest? In any case, Adonijah is surely meant to be kept under surveillance. And Solomon has already put him on warning. So let's just take a look. Our, our, our numbers are diminishing by the minute, but we've got the hardcore right here. Um, any, <laughs> any thoughts? He didn't about, run away from the feast. <laughs> any thoughts or questions about uh, where we are so far? No. Jane, go ahead. Doesn't Nathan have a vested interest in seeing Solomon become the king? Because yeah. it was actually Nathan uh, who was his teacher, was Solomon's teacher during his life, where he doesn't seem to have any relationship at all, at all with Adonisia. Remember, we didn't even know there was such a guy, really, until mm -hmm. now. And, and remember, the other name for um, Solomon is beloved of God. So he's definitely the, fa and, and it's the theme, once again, of a younger sibling taking over. That is consistent throughout all of these stories, is the younger one is the one who inherits the mantle of leadership. It is not the older one, even though in terms of, let's say, human legal matters, the older one inherits more than the younger. And the older one would be the one to succeed in every case. Like if you look at all those stories in Genesis, mm -hmm. it's always the younger one, always. So Absalom was the oldest. Of course, he rebelled against his father. So he was killed in the uh, rebellion. Uh, the next in line would be Adonisha. Yeah, they're the only two left, right? Oh, I'm sure he's got plenty of other kids. No, but I mean from the from the big four or five wives. These are the only. Well, he had no child in Michal. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know. I I don't remember. There are some places where it talks about his kids and his wives uh -huh. and everything. I can't remember. I don't even remember if we had mentioned. How I think these are the only two that are that have any standing that are left. Maybe. The others are from minor wives and you know concubines. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, the, but the important thing is that, again, Solomon is a younger. And that's always good. Now, I took a class once at the American Jewish University 
at the time it was the University of Judaism. And I don't think the teacher was Jewish. I could be wrong, but he was looking at the Bible as literature. And he was saying that he thought the reason that the younger one kept inheriting over the older one was because the Israelites came to Canaan and displaced already existing people who lived there. Oh, interesting Eek. idea. Yeah, interesting idea when you think about uh, the formation of the modern state of Israel, like, ah, <laughs> I don't like that explanation, but you know, uh, it could be, it could be, you know, they came in, there were Canaanites were already living there, right? Some of them joined, probably the people of you know the Israelites and others were possibly killed displaced whatever so it could be an unconscious attempt to justify that I don't know I mean the, the another explanation is just that you know God does not follow human laws so even though we say the older one is going to inherit or is going to be the leader God says we're going to undercut that yeah. There may be other reasons. Go ahead, Christine. There's a, a common reason in other uh, state formation places where the the eldest son is seen as a threat rather oh. than um, an heir. Interesting. And and, um, and so you have de facto ultimate genitor or the, the inheritance by younger siblings oh. because they're not seen as such a threat. What do they do with the older ones? Usually they kill them. <laughs> <laughs> It's in like, the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century, the son that inherited had all his brothers killed because they were considered threats. Okay, that's yeah, and that's all that's, of them. And in uh, you know, Dahomey, any yeah. concubines, so. right? And in Dahomey, after the king dies, his son does not inherit at all. It's the the one of the sons of the con concubines. There's like a free for all. Uh, interregnum war, and the one that survives with his mother becomes the next king and queen. You know, when you, you think know. about what's going on in our country today, it's not really that different. We're not necessarily killing each other, although sometimes we do, but, you know, this kind of battle for which narrative is going to win out is similar to the succession fights, you know, Whenever you have somebody fighting for power, you end up with the same stupid tropes over and over and over again, because power is so limited. Yeah. And I mean, limited as a, something to actually live for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, let's, let's look a little bit at the next uh, chapter and see what is going to happen here. All righty. Is David going to die? Good. Oh, I'll read. here we are. We have to we have to end his story. <laughs> yes, let's end it for you know today. Oh, good. Finally, get him out of the way. Oh God. <laughs> All right. Do you want to read? Yeah, I said I'll read it because he's going to die, and I'm happy. He's going to die here. Yes. <laughs> when David's time to die drew near, he charged his son Solomon, saying, "I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong. Be courageous." And keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, so that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. Then the Lord will establish his word that he spoke concerning me. If your heirs take heed to their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail you a successor on the throne of Israel. Okay, so this does not sound at all like David. Come on. No. And uh, according to Alter, this was added in four centuries later by some kind of Deuteronomist. Um, trying to clean up some of the stuff here. After everybody forgot. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, David is not Mr. Let's follow the commandments, you know, and be pure. Okay. Moreover, you know also what Joab, son of Zariah, did to me and how he dealt with the two commanders of the armies of Israel, Abner, son of Ner, and Amasa, son of Jether, whom he murdered, retaliating in time of peace for blood that had been shed in war, 
and putting innocent blood on the belt around my waist and on the sandals on my feet. Act, therefore, according to your wisdom, but do not let his gray head go down to Sheol in peace. Deal loyally, however, with the sons of Barzillai the Gileadite, and let them be amongst those who eat at your table. For such loyalty, they met me when I fled from your brother Absalom. There is also with you Shammai, son of Gera, a Benjaminite from Bahurim, who cursed me with a terrible curse on the day when I went to Mahanaim. But when he came down to meet me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, I will not put you to death with the sword. Therefore, do not hold him guiltless, for you are a wise man. You will know what you ought to do to him, and you must bring his gray head down with blood to Sheol. Remember, Sheol is where dead people go. So from five all the way down to nine, this is revenge, right? Like David's saying, take revenge against all my enemies. So Alter's theory is that the reason we got all this stuff before that, all this like, you know, follow the statutes and the commandments and everything is a way to sort of clean up this, you know, blood revenge that he's, you know, going into afterwards. Notice also that, let me move this down here. Um, he says to him, you know, this guy, um, Shammai, I swore I would not kill him by the sword. You figure out a way to kill him some other way. Find a loophole. You know, it's really a bad thing when, when someone says, I will not kill you by the sword. Like God says, I will not ever destroy the world again by flood. Uh-oh, well, there are many other ways to destroy the world. So he's saying, find a loophole and get him. And the last words that he utters is verse nine. You will know what you ought to do to him and you must bring his gray head down with blood to Sheol. Those are David's last words. Yikes. Okay, now he's going to actually die. Jane, you'll be very happy. <laughs> then David slept with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. The time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father, David, and his king was firmly established. His David, kingdom was firmly established. David is now gone. And we are going to go into the reign of King Solomon. Okay. Then Adoniah, son of Haggith, came to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. She asked, do you come peace, peaceably? He said, peaceably. Then he said, may I have a word with you? She said, go on. He said, you know that the kingdom was mine and that all Israel expected me to reign. However, the kingdom has turned about and become my brother's, for it was his from the Lord. And now I have one request to make of you. Do not refuse me. She said to him, go on. He said, please ask King Solomon. He will not refuse you to give me Abishag the Shunammite as my wife. Okay. Ha ha, what does this remind you of something? Yeah, <laughs> what does it remind you of? It reminds me of, uh, what is it, Absalom on the rooftop with the, all the concubines in full view. And Reuben also sleeping with his father, yeah. Jacob's concubine. Oh yeah. It's like, yeah. what the hell, are you trying to get yourself killed? Yeah. <laughs> really? Let me have my father's concubine? And Bathsheba ain't stupid. Oh, yeah. hey, I'll certainly let the king know. Oh, sure. Like. Okay. No Can't problem. Wait to have an audience with him. So Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him on behalf of Adoniah. The king rose to meet her and bowed down to her. Then he sat on his throne and had a throne brought for the king's mother. And she sat on his right. Then she said, 
I have one more small request to make of you. Do not refuse me. And the king said to her, make your request, my mother, for I will not refuse you. She said, let Abishag the Shunammite be given to your brother uh, Adonia as his wife. And uh, King Solomon asked, answered his mother. And why do you ask Abishag the Shunammite for Ad Adonia? Ask for him the kingdom as well, for he is my old, elder brother. And the priests Abiathar and Joab, son of Zeruiah, are on his side. Then King Solomon swore by the Lord, so may God do to me and more also for Adonia has devised this scheme at the risk of his life. Now, therefore, as the Lord lives, who has established me and placed me on the throne of my father, David, and has made me a house as he promised, today Adonia shall be put to death. So King Solomon sent Benias, son of Jehoiada, he struck him down and he died. So Bathsheba kind of cleverly says, oh, I'm just gonna ask you for a little tiny favor. It's really a small thing. Can you just give your, fa your father's um, concubine to your older brother? Yeah, that's just a small thing. You know, knowing full well that Solomon's gonna go, uh, excuse me, because obviously this is like a step towards trying to retake the kingdom. Like, I've got my father's concubine. Next thing you know, I've got my father's throne. It's really stupid. Um, but I guess when you're ambitious, you just get blinded to reality in many ways, right? So he's another one down. All right, let's go. The king said to the priest, Abiathar, go to Anatot, to your estate, for you deserve death. <laughs> but I will not at this time put you to death because you carried the ark of the Lord God before my father David and because you shared in all the hardships my father endured. So Solomon banished Abiathar from being priest to the Lord, thus fulfilling the word of the Lord that he had spoken concerning the house of Eli in Shiloh. So here's a comment by um, Alter. Throughout this episode centering on Indonesia, Solomon shows himself to be decisive and, and emphatic and ruthless, a worthy son of his father. The moment he hears of Indonesia's pretensions to the late king's nurse bedmate, he orders him to be killed immediately. He then proceeds to remove from office and banish the key priestly supporter of Indonesia, and he will go on to deal with Joab as well. So he is not messing around. It, you know, he just got put on the throne and he's already making sure that none of these people are gonna, you know, try to shove him over. When the news came to Joab, for Joab had supported Adonia through, though he had not supported Absalom, Joab fled to the tent of the Lord and grasped the horns of the altar. Yeah, Joab is rightfully terrified at this point. And let's see if the altar is going to help him. When it was told King Solomon, Joab had fled to the tent of the Lord and now is beside the altar. Solomon sent Benia, son of Jehoiada, saying, go strike him down. So Benia came to the tent of the Lord and said to him, the king commands, come out. But he said, no, I will die here. Then Benia brought the king word again saying, thus said Joab and thus he answered me. The king replied to him, do as he has said, strike him down and bury him and thus take away from me and from my father's house, the guilt for the blood that Joab shed without cause. The Lord will bring back his bloody deeds on his own head because without the knowledge of my father, David, he attacked and killed with the sword two men more righteous and better than he, Abner, son of Ner, commander of the army of Israel, 
and Amasah, son of Jether, commander of the army of Judah. So shall their blood come back on the head of Joab and on the head of his descendants forever. But to David and to his descendants and to his house and to his throne, there shall be peace from the Lord forevermore. Then Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, went up and struck him down and killed him. And he was buried in his own house near the wilderness. The king put Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, over the army in his place. And the king put the priest Zadok in the place of Abiathar. Okay, we're going to stop here. So you see that he is definitely very decisive, very ruthless. I mean, the, the altar in the, you know, sanctuary is supposed to be a place where you, you have sanctuary and he doesn't care. You're, you're dying. That's it. I don't care what you try to do. He's just so very, very quickly getting rid of one threat after the other to really solidify his throne. Um, so we'll stop here. And uh, we have one more session, June 4th, before the summer. And so we'll go a little further into Solomon's story. And then uh, we'll pick it up again in September. So any final comments or questions for the diehards who are still here? I'm just glad that King David has finally left the stage. <laughs> okay, yeah, we spent quite a bit of time with him. <laughs> Now, there's this book by Jonathan Kirsch about King David. The, the problem with that book is it's basically a paraphrase of the whole thing. It's not very analytical. So, you know, if anybody just instead of, want, instead of wanting to read the Bible wants to read a paraphrase, that's a good book to read. But otherwise, I, I didn't find it very, you know, incisive or, or compelling. Um, okay, well, everyone have a great rest of the Shabbat and a good weekend. And uh, we do have Job coming up on Thursday. The last session on Job. No, not this June first or June second. Two two weeks, right? Two weeks. Okay, I I, I have lost track of the time. It's yeah. funny, but as we were going through this, I kept, especially when God tells David to do a census, and there's then punishes everybody for it. I kept thinking of the Book of Job. Of finding the Book of Job is now an overlay on everything I'm reading. Yeah, so it uh, definitely. Um, has a force that I hadn't anticipated. Yeah, it's a very powerful book. Yeah. 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 Okay, everybody. So we'll Bye. see you tomorrow, right? Oh, yeah. Bye. Bagels and yeah. lunch for those who live near here. Hey. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Okay.